Good Friday. How can today be good? Today is the day in which this solemn liturgy commemorates the worst thing that ever happened in the history of the world. We killed God, the Savior of the world who was sent by God, prepared for from ages gone by, sent on a rescue mission to save us, and we killed him. The solemn beginning of this liturgy is fitting in that what do we do in the face of that? The ministers simply come in and prostrate on the floor asking for God's mercy in that opening prayer. I wonder how many times we actually think to ask for mercy or understand how much we need mercy. In order to know that this day is good, we have to know how bad the bad news is. Sometimes in our lives, I think we want to gloss over and pretend that it's not really that bad. It's not really that bad. My sins, sure, I've got sins, but you know, God and I, we have an understanding. God understands. Well, certainly, as we hear from the letter to the Hebrews today, God does understand our weaknesses. But woe to us if we think that somehow our sins are no big deal. Good Friday is good if it helps us realize just how bad sin is. The Roman Missal, the instructions for Mass, give on this day during the veneration of the Holy Cross several chants, a hymn, musical options. One of those that is very striking to me is a set of responses and antiphons simply known as the reproaches. And these are verses spoken by God to us. And they're very accusatory. They reproach us by using all the ways that God has been so good to us. There's that word, good. God has been very, very good to us. He has given us everything we need. And throughout the history of salvation, when we rejected God over and over, again and again, God would say, I'm coming, I will rescue you. And he did. The reproaches call to mind, especially God's great rescue mission in the wilderness when he saved Moses and brought the Israelites through the Red Sea. But it's, it's the refrain of the reproaches that comes back over and over that gets me every time. It says simply, my people, what have I done to you? Or how have I grieved you? Answer me. Do we often think of God of making demands of us asking us to be held accountable for our sins and what we've done. My people, what have I done to you? How have I grieved you? Answer me. Because I led you out of the land of Egypt, you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Because I led you through the desert for 40 years and fed you with manna and brought you into the land of plenty, you have prepared a cross for your Savior. What more should I have done for you and if not done? Indeed, I planted you as my most beautiful choice vine, and you have turned very bitter for me. For in my thirst you gave me vinegar to drink, and with a lance you pierced your Savior's side. I scourged Egypt for your sake with its firstborn sons. And you scourged me and handed me over. My people, what have I done to you? Or how have I grieved you? Answer me. I led you out from Egypt 
as Pharaoh lay sunk in the Red Sea. And you have handed me over to the chief priests. I opened the sea before you, and you opened my side with a lance. I fed you with manna in the desert, and on me you rained blows and lashes. I gave you saving water from the rock to drink, and for drink you gave me gall and vinegar. I put in your hand a royal scepter, and you put on my head a crown of thorns. My people, what have I done to you? How have I grieved you? Answer me. Quite the sayings to call to mind as we come before the cross today. Perhaps we don't know what to do, what to say. God in the reproaches is demanding an answer. Answer me. It, it almost demands. Our, our sins weigh heavy upon us, and we come before God, and God rightly says of us, what have I done to you? What did I do to deserve this? Answer me. How many times we use those words when we face suffering? What have I done to deserve this? Why is this happening to me? Why do bad things happen to good people? And we have our objections. But today, we remain quiet and silent as we hear God ask us, What have I done to you? How have I grieved you? Answer me. But then we take up the beautiful hymn known in the Latin as Crux Fidelis, Faithful Cross. Faithful cross, the saints rely on. Noble tree beyond compare. Never was there such a scion. Never leaf nor flower so rare. Sweet the timber, sweet the iron, sweet the burden that they bear. Good Friday. The worst thing becomes good. And even the instrument of torture, the cross, Today we can claim as the faithful cross, the crux fidelis that we rely on. What a day of juxtapositions then. For when Adam first offended, eating that forbidden fruit, not all hopes of glory ended. When the serpent at the root, broken nature would be mended by a second tree and shoot. We look all the way back to the Garden of Eden when this debt of sin was first entered. Adam stretched out and took the apple from his wife Eve, who herself had taken it from a tree. And a tree brought death to you and me through original sin. But today, as we commemorate the wood of the cross and the tree that takes the life of Jesus, again, things are flipped around. The bad becomes good. The cross becomes salvation as life comes now from a tree to undo the death that came from the tree in the Garden of Eden. The veneration of the cross today is perhaps the, the moment I remember most as a young child coming forward and outside of COVID times, I remember being told now you go and you, you kiss the cross, you kiss the feet of Jesus. It seemed very strange to me. It seemed a little bit too personal. I didn't want to kiss the cross that everybody else was kissing and it seemed all so personal. And yet that's exactly what it's supposed to be. Today, our sin, our constantly reaching out for the wrong tree, for the wrong fruit, should be personal. 
Because it is our own personal sin, not somebody else's, not some bad thing that happened to me, a good person, but rather the cold reality that I choose sin. I choose not God in so very many ways. And today we hear God reproach us, certainly, but then we are faced with the reality that makes this day good. That despite all that, despite our unworthiness, despite the fact that we have no answer to God, answer me. We have no answer. Despite all that, Jesus still says, I choose you. I choose to die for you. Because you can't do it. Because you have no answer. Because you can't save yourself. Because you are helpless and weak, Jesus chooses to die. It is his choice. As we see in the Passion from St. John, he takes the divine name, I am, in the garden, and people are falling to the ground. Jesus has all the power. And with his power, he chooses not to condemn you and me, but to lay down his life in one ultimate, final act of sacrifice, that makes us free. It is because of that that today we can call this day good, that we can even call the cross today the crux fidelis, the faithful cross that we can rely on. Lofty timber, smooth your roughness, flex your boughs for blossoming, let your fibers loose their toughness gently, Let your tendrils cling. Lay aside your native gruffness. Clasp the body of your king. Noblest tree of all created, richly jeweled and embossed. Post by lamb's blood consecrated, spar that saves the tempest-tossed. Scaffold beam which elevated carries what the world has cost. Today we come to celebrate the cost that brought Jesus to the cross and made that cross the faithful cross. Because with his death, Jesus has canceled our death. He has canceled our debt. Because of that, on this day in which the worst thing that ever happened took place, because we know the whole story, today we can call this day good. God's Friday, good Friday.